I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, Jason Matheny. Jason is president and the chief executive officer of the Rand Corporation, a nonprofit, nonpartisan research organization that helps improve policy and decision making through research and analysis. Prior to becoming Rand's president and CEO in July 2022, he led White House policy on technology and national security at the National Security Council, the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Previously, he was founding director of the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at the Georgetown University and director of the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, where he was responsible for developing advanced technologies for the U.S. intelligence community. Before IARPA, he worked for Oxford University, the World Bank, the Applied Physics Laboratory, the Center for Biosecurity, and Princeton University. Jason has served on many nonpartisan boards and committees, including the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, to which he was appointed by Congress in 2018. Jason is joined by Alexander Wang, CEO and founder at Scale. Alex, over to you. Jason, super excited to be chatting today. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, it's been it's been a little bit. I'm excited to, to catch up. Um, you know, I I uh, you you are obviously one of the sort of uh, experts on national security, and we've had amazing conversations in the past about national security and AI. So I'm really excited to talk through all that. Um, but but first, I always love to just um, hear people's stories and, and chat through that. So uh, first, why don't you just talk about how you came to be so involved in the intersection of national security and technology? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't plan on it. Um, I started out in international health and I uh, worked in epidemiology on sort of infectious disease control um, and was working in, in India on um, an HIV and malaria project uh, in 2002 when the first uh, virus was synthesized from scratch. And um, it was sort of a, uh, a sobering moment for public health where, um, you know, we, we'd spent like decades eradicating um, the smallpox uh, virus. And then we were working on like polio eradication. And here basically like a science project showed that you could create a virus from scratch from its chemical constituents. And that raised a lot of like hard security problems, like, you know, how do you govern a technology that can be used to create de novo, um, a really destructive virus? Um, so I started getting interested in this intersection of, uh, of technology and security and moved uh, to work in the intelligence community for, for about a decade um, on research projects that could help us to, de to, to detect uh, disease outbreaks sooner, uh, figure out what was happening in uh, foreign biological weapons laboratories, um, try to figure out how to like um, blend analytic judgments from lots of different people. Um, and then uh, worked in um, national security policy because I found that a lot of times the intelligence that we were providing to policymakers was about technology. And it was really hard for policymakers to interpret or make judgments on because there weren't that many policymakers who had a technology background. And so we thought a lot about like, how do we educate policymakers about technology? Um, so I spent some time on that and then spent some time uh, at the White House on technology and national security policy. And then just two months ago, uh, joined uh, RAND, uh, where I am right now, amazing place that, uh, that does research uh, in support of good policy. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's awesome. And obviously you, you have such a recent perspective into uh, you know, all the hot topics when it comes to national security, technology, and policy, given your time at OSTP and NSC recently. Uh, I'm curious to maybe just kick off, what are some of the things that you think about, you know, most vividly when you think about the, the hottest topics today when it comes to uh, national security policy and, and how that pertains to technology broadly? We'll zoom into AI in a bit here, but... 
Yeah, I think, um, I mean, in my, in my last job, I think the, the work was sort of split between um, thinking about catastrophic risks from things like, like you know, biological weapons, uh, nuclear weapons, cyber weapons, um, and then the other half of, of the portfolio was thinking about how to improve the competitiveness of the United States and our allies and partners. And I probably spent um, the vast majority of my time doing things like talent scouting uh, to find people way smarter than me to work on those problems. Um, and then, you know, giving them the support that they needed to take on the big policy problems. Um, but in, in terms of substance, probably about, about half of the work uh, was focused on catastrophic risks and the other half on competitiveness. And within catastrophic risks, most of my time was probably spent on the biological risks. Um, you know, we're entering this period where like a single uh, sophisticated biologist could kill millions of people with technologies that are, that are publicly accessible. And we just don't have the governance to prevent uh, catastrophic misuse of those technologies. We're largely relying on, on luck that of, you know, the people who have the skills and, and the tools to do something catastrophic, none of them currently want to, we hope. Uh, but we've seen from, you know, groups historically like M. Shinrico, you know, people with apocalyptic beliefs or mental illness um, who have uh, who've been around in the past um, and have done um, a lot of harm, but have sort of been um, prevented from doing even more harm because of technical constraints. And so now, now some of those technical constraints have been have been lifted due to advances in synthetic biology. So we do have to really think carefully about how to govern uh, that technology. Um, AI, I think a lot of our, our anxiety was about sort of AI's applications to um, offensive cyber weapons. And I think my thinking there has been really deeply informed by um, you know, by conversations with you over the years and with people like Ben Buchanan, uh, who is a colleague at, at Georgetown and at the White House, who's done a lot of really thoughtful work and thinking about the impacts of, of AI on cyber. Um, and then nuclear weapons policy, which continues to be something that's like really hard uh, to get right and for us to, you know, uh, just continue to um, to work on nonproliferation and work on confidence building measures that can reduce uh, escalation. So um, those were sort of the the Debbie Downer things that I worked on. And then on the on the positive side, on the like kind of U.S. competitiveness side, we worked on policies on you know defensive work like investment screening, export controls, research security, and then on the proactive side, you know improving our ability to hire technical experts in the government, um, analytic capabilities to assess advances in technology globally. Um, improving STEM immigration policy was a huge push for us. I think, you know, it's one of the great asymmetric advantages of the United States and other democracies is that we're really attractive places for scientists and engineers globally to want to live. And that's a source of strength historically. You know, our success in World War II, our success during the Cold War depended largely on our ability to attract uh, the world's best uh, scientists and engineers. I think it's still a source of, of great uh, competitiveness for the United States. And then lastly, making key investments in science and technology through things like the CHIPS Act uh, that, that recently passed. Yeah, well, I, we'll want to cover um, off on a lot of these a lot of these pieces. But, you know, maybe to start out with it, it, the first question is just on the intersection of the first two topics you mentioned, synthetic bi biology um, or sort of like biological risk and AI, you know, at the same time as everything we've been talking about, uh, DeepMind has come out with AlphaFold and they've actually launched sort of the uh, full, uh, the full sort of sequencing and unfolding of uh, all proteins that humanity has ever seen. I think 200 million proteins, those are like full folding of all those proteins using AlphaFold. Um, and so there's all these like exciting threads happening in the application of AI to um, to biology and synthetic biology. Um, how did you gauge those risks? You know, I, I think I think part of what you're saying is that hey, even just right now, we're in a we're in a potentially scary environment when it comes to the the biological risks of of sort of bad actors. How do you think AI either uh, ex sort of exacerbates that problem or even potentially mitigates it? Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, 
Yeah. I mean, even though like most of my job has been like as the nervous Nelly, like worrying about the bad applications of, of tech. I mean, there's obviously like enormous upside potential um, for AI to be an enabler for scientific discovery, for engineering design. Um, and I think, you know, AlphaFold is an example like that where um, where a problem that had eluded, you know, human ingenuity for you know decades um, was was able to be solved um, at a scale that um, is transformative um, using AI. And I think the you know the upside potential of that is you know not only improvements in medicine but also thinking about you know advanced materials, thinking about um, sort of biology as a factory. Um, for for growing um, uh, materials and objects um, very cost effectively, uh, for producing uh, fuel and and energetics um, more cost effectively, um, and and I think you know in general like the the way that we'll see AI as an accelerant um, for uh, for discovery and for for engineering is likely to be really profound. Um, you know not just in biology but also in in physics and and chemistry um, and we're also, I think, going to, um, I mean, I've, I've heard this sort of described that like, uh, you know, the language of physics uh, was mathematics and like the language of biology, you know, could be AI because you really, it's like so difficult to model um, uh, uh, deterministically um, biological systems, but but AI might be like the enabler to do a lot um, uh, of, of predictive modeling uh, in biology in ways that, that we couldn't do before. Um, there is, of course, the um, uh, the sort of misuse of 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 AI for um, for biology and and for chemistry. And I think one really thoughtful piece about this was a an article in uh, Nature Machine Intelligence a couple months ago, uh, showing that if you sort of like reverse the reward function for um, for systems that are designed to estimate uh, toxicity of a novel chemical, um, you can end up you know, engineering uh, chemicals that uh, that are nerve agents, um, even if if it doesn't already know what a nerve agent uh, is or looks like, uh, you can end up uh, engineering one de novo. Um, so I think that's something we'll have to we'll have to figure out. Like, what do you do? You control access to APIs for systems like that? I mean, I don't I don't know that that's going to be realistic because these were. I I think that particular paper was like run um, on a model that was uh, that was trained on a laptop. Um, so it's not like we're talking about a huge amount of compute. Um, and I, I think we're, we're going to have to come up with some sort of like uh, more creative approaches to figuring out how to avoid the downside while, while um, at the same time benefiting from the enormous upside. Yeah. And, and to that point, I mean, one of the huge trends in artificial intelligence has been the massive um, democratization and, and in some ways commoditization of the technology. You know, the the large language models, which just two years ago, you know, OpenAI first released GPT-3 and was sort of this, it felt like this magical technology that was behind, you know, the, the sort of uh, their, their walled gardens. It's now replicated. There's open source large language models. Um, there's, you know, the same thing happened at Dolly. There was Dolly and now there's stable diffusion, all these open source um, alternatives. And so the, the massive trend in artificial intelligence just towards huge, amounts of democratization, globalization, and making the technology very accessible to everyone, which um, obviously can be very good because it sort of spurs innovation even further, but to your point, creates greater risks of misuse of the technology. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would love sort of your thoughts too on, um, on like where, where code generation is gonna go. I mean, thanks to these, uh, these language models. I mean, it seems like one of the most, uh, you know, sort of like transformative applications of those models um, would be to, you know, writing software, writing code. Um, and we've seen some, you know, experiments that are really interesting uh, right now. Where do you see that playing out? I mean, do you think this is going to become more and more common? Yeah, I mean, I think code generation is an application that's clearly here to stay. Developers love it. Um, and it's going to write ultimately more and more of the code that gets produced every day. And I think as a result, as, as a community, we're going to be able to generate just much, much more code that's more, you know, uh, more productively and sort of more impactful than we were able to before. I think, you know, to almost touch on your second point around what are the cyber risks of AI, I think that, you know, AI systems that can understand code and can also generate code are, um, are a big risk 
from a cyber perspective because all of a sudden you have the capability to, to, to build AI agents that can almost on the fly engineer you know, a cyber attack or on the fly engineer sort of the, the way to get into a system. And so I think that there's, um, you know, there's no way to look at these things as, as sort of like uh, technologies without any risks. And, and so the defense against those risks end up being, um, end up being pretty challenging. So I, I, you know, maybe the simplest way to talk about it is like, we're entering a new era when it comes to code and AI. Um, you know, a lot of code is gonna be auto-generated. A lot of stuff that used to require programmers is no longer gonna require programmers. Programmers are gonna be able to operate at a higher level. Um, those, all those things are good. Um, at the same time, you now need to just be prepared for sort of a, an order of magnitude more capable uh, of of agents and risks on the other end. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, it's a, a a great point too that like you know vulnerability discovery and that uh, sort of like cyber weapon, cyber weapons that are uh, that are kind of like tailored, um, uh, you know, in real time, um, like as they um, as they interact with uh, with a system, um, could be something that we'll see like a lot more frequently in the future. On the defensive side, I mean, then you would, you know, see like all sorts of like real time improvements and fuzzing and like other things that could be really valuable. And, you know, one thing I've, I've just been trying to figure out is, are we going to see like defense or offense have like any kind of advantage? Like, is there is there for any reason some kind of asymmetric advantage on the defense or offensive applications of of AI to cyber? And I, I don't know, and I, I don't know if there's, um, if, if you have an intuition about this, um, but you know, are, do you think like in the, in the long term, are we going to see defense helped more or offense helped more by the application of AI to cyber? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I think more often than not in cyber, um, the offense always uh, gets stronger, and it's, it's tough to, it's tough to protect against. There's sort of always a, a very large number of attack vectors and, and sort of um, it's a very hard problem to be able to defend against all of them. Yeah. Which is, yeah. Um, which is one of the reasons why I think your former job was, uh, was so hard. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sort of yeah. Impossible, <laughs> impossible surface area to protect against. You know, I, one, I, you, you know, you have, um, you've spent a lot of time in the intelligence community as well. And, and I think AI can be applied to, many of the problems within, within um, intelligence pretty effectively. And then I think you have a lot of the same questions. Hey, is AI uh, more of a offensive enabler or a defensive enabler when it comes to intelligence? I, I'm curious, you know, obviously at a, at a high level, what your sort of read on the situation is. Like how does, how will AI affect the, the sort of world of intelligence? Yeah, I mean, we, we already see these like really great um, you know, applications of, of AI, especially to kind of like perceptual data, you know, like, like imagery. Um, and I, I mean, we see like commercial analogs of this too, just, you know, like really creative, um, uh, applications of, of AI to commercial overhead imagery from satellites. Um, and in general, like, I do believe that an asymmetric advantage of democracies is, is like transparency that like, you know, we can, we really benefit from, open source intelligence or intelligence that we sort of share with the world to bring it into the sunlight. And I think we're seeing a lot of this in, in Ukraine, like, you know, just a much faster timeline to declassify imagery that we have, um, or uh, like an intelligence, you know, picture of what's happening on the ground. But we're also seeing that in sort of like citizen intelligence of, you know, folks who, um, who are on the ground taking pictures of things, but then things being like geotagged or labeled in ways that are a lot uh, a lot easier to kind of build a composite intelligence picture from. So I think that sort of work will continue. And I think in general, like the application of, of AI to otherwise unmanageable volumes of, of data um, uh, is, is gonna just increase and will improve our sort of ability to make sense of what's, of what's happening in the world and be able to share it faster uh, with the world uh, in ways that I think are, are ultimately going to, you know, improve um, security and safety and human rights. I mean, I think just bringing things to light in general is, is good. Um, I think there's there's gonna be um, applications of AI to cyber. And I think there, I, I'm, I'm sort of with you, I think that I, like my intuition is like offense will maybe at least initially start seeing like way more applications than defense, I'm not sure, but 
it seems like defenders sort of best hope is maybe sharing data in a way that attackers are unlikely to. So if we can create, uh, if we can turn the competition between offense and defense and cyber to one of uh, who is able to pool data uh, most effectively, then I would feel like more confident that like defenders could get um, an advantage just because there's likely to be more shared sort of sympathy among uh, groups of defenders than in groups of attackers. Um, and then I think the, you know, there's applications of AI to things like robotic systems. Um, there's the whole notion of, um, of sort of, uh, uh, like objects or, or, um, activity based collections. So if you have like a sensor that's in a particular place, you, it may not be useful for that sensor to be focused on a particular thing all the time and collecting data from it, just clogging yeah. bandwidth, but you might want it to be sort of like tipped or cued by a particular uh, you know object or activity that it sees that then it decides to phone home you know if you've got like a sensor that's uh, near a nuclear facility and it may not make sense for it to be phoning home all the time um, but you want it to phone home when it sees something that's like really concerning um, otherwise it's like creating uh, a greater likelihood for the sensor to be detected um, so I think there's there's sorts of applications like that um, in the um, uh, kind of like activity based sensing space, um, and then I think there's there's applications across kind of like decision support and logistics and um, and that sort of stuff. Like, is it really like sexy? But like, is probably actually incredibly important. Like a lot of these back office functions, um, like you know finance or you know like organizing personnel records. Um, Security clearances, which take like a crazy amount of time and ends up sort of slowing everything else down, could be helped a lot just by um, by automating certain parts of the process of, of the security clearance. Um, so those sorts of things maybe aren't like as intellectually interesting as some of the other things in terms of being like, you know, really like cutting edge, you know, applications, but it, it could actually make a huge difference. Um, in terms of um, improving the timeliness and relevance of intelligence in the long run. Totally. Um, you know, I wanted to, to go back to one of the underlying enablers to, or two of the underlying enablers of this technology that you'd referenced earlier on um, in one of your earlier answers. Uh, you know, one of which is chips and the other is, is sort of uh, access to the best technical talent. Um, or, or sort of continued access to the best technical talent. Let's talk about the Chips, Chips Act first, because that obviously was a huge piece of legislation and, and uh, a really big uh, monumental uh, sort of result for America. And I actually saw a CNAS report recently that talked about how the, um, uh, the sort of like lead scientist for the, for the CCP uh, actually commented in, in some forum in China that, uh, you know, he viewed that the fact that the U.S. acted on the Chips Act shows that, you know, in some ways China's acting more resolutely or more clearly than than China on a lot of this technology. I don't know if you'd seen that, um, but but I'm curious. You know, I know you worked really hard on the Chips Act. I know it was a very long and lengthy process, and it was something that we'd even been talking about years and years ago. Something that was really critical. Um, from your perspective, what is what's sort of at stake? What what was the what are you excited about with with the Chips Act, and what do you think the the sort of um, paint maybe a little bit of the sort of um, positive outcome that can result from the Chips Act. Yeah, I mean, I, first I think um, it's a it's a good thing that we got it passed. I mean, I think it's a it's a positive step uh, for the country um, and for our partners and allies as well because there's a really important piece of this, which is kind of a multilateral um, strategy for semiconductor supply chain security. Um, I think if if we think about the the sort of like absolute impact on the semiconductor supply chain, it's going to be relatively modest um, because just so much of the supply chain is is concentrated in Taiwan and particularly with TSMC, and it's it's going to be very difficult, like in a single piece of legislation, to substantially reduce our dependence on that supply chain. Um, but this is a it's a good first step. And, uh, and I think there's also a lot of really important provisions in there, um, the guardrail provisions, um, uh, for example, that I think are, um, are important to like not give up um, certain kinds of supply chain advantages uh, that democratic countries have uh, in, in semiconductor manufacturing and design. 
Um, and then I think another important piece of the, of the CHIPS and Science Act is the science piece, which is um, really um, you know, enabling through the authorizing language, uh, the National Science Foundation to be sort of invigorated to take on uh, important parts of technology competition. Um, and I think you know the group that Erwin and um, and Ponch at NSF are doing to um, to create an NSF that really is going to be a key part of a national effort and technology competitiveness. Um, I think has been amazing. I mean, those uh, those two are um, a, a couple of I think the most effective people working in in the federal government. So that is also I think a, a really important piece of the legislation. Um, this is such a hard problem, and I think. Uh, as you pointed out, I think like microelectronics and talent, like these are you know two really key fundamental variables. Um, we paid a lot of attention lately to the microelectronics piece of this. Um, we need to think about um, scenarios that involve Taiwan and how to you know credibly deter Taiwan scenarios, given the importance that Taiwan plays globally. Um, and you know a Taiwan uh, Straits crisis would just be catastrophic. For everybody, so like preventing that um, is, I think, incredibly important. But the talent piece is also so important. And one of the things that we really tried uh, when I was in my last job uh, to try to get into the Chips and Science Act was this uh, Lofgren provision from Representative Lofgren that would have basically stapled a green card, you know, to every uh, PhD holder in in science and engineering. Um, and we we couldn't get it through to the to the end, uh, you know, in the in the legislation that passed. But you know, for decades we've been talking about the importance of of STEM immigration um, to American competitiveness. And if you know, I think all the all the evidence supports um, what a high rate of return there is uh, for that for for the U.S. Um, and I I think you know ultimately it, it would it would be. Uh, the sort of legislation that could end up being, you know, really transformative for the U.S. ability to compete. Yeah, totally. You know, from um, from your perspective, let's take a let's take a, a longer arc for for sort of like U.S. competitive position in these key technologies, AI, biology, um, et cetera. You know, what do you think are just for you know? There's a, there's a lot of technology, um, people in the technology industry who are sort of looking at this, whether they're technologists or, or uh, people who manage large technology programs or whatnot. What, what would your, what would sort of your, the set of things that you would be like, we have to always be thinking about A, B, and C to ensure that the United States stays ahead in technology over the next, you know, 50 years? I mean, I think talent is is number one. Like, I mean, if you if you are the most attractive destination for scientists and and engineers in a particular area, you're going to have an enormous advantage, and um, that historically has been a great advantage for the United States. But um, that advantage is is diminishing. I mean, in in part, like in part for good reasons. Like, the world is getting richer as a whole, and so there are more opportunities, um, and uh, you know, more countries are. Are also becoming attractive destinations um, for for scientists and engineers, um, but we you know we continue to have the strongest research universities in the world that are very attractive uh, to scientists and engineers. Um, we continue to have really vibrant cities that are uh, that are great for scientists and engineers to live in, and they want to raise families in. Um, so we we just need to make sure that we are like still the destination of choice um, for for the world. Um, in STEM. I think the other key things are, there are a lot of these, um, I mean, I, I do think that like AI, uh, computing and biotech are like probably, you know, the three most important like categories of technology um, for the next few decades. And I, I think that um, what's interesting about microelectronics is that you actually do have to like make stuff, like you have to, you know, put atoms together um, with incredible precision in order to um, in order to produce uh, hardware that works. And putting those atoms together relies on this in, like really exotic supply chain of um, you know photolithography tools and wafer cutting tools and etching tools. And that tool supply chain is incredibly important and one that I think we we have not viewed as the kind of strategic asset that it it really is. Um, in fact, we, 
we as a country sort of like gave away a lot of the uh, the key technology related to extreme ultraviolet photolithography uh, that's now uh, in the Netherlands, even though a lot of the fundamental components were developed um, in, in national labs, as, as you know. And um, I think we need to be just really careful that we're not like giving away other parts of, of the supply chain. Um, and the same is true for, for biotechnology. I mean, it, it relies on DNA synthesizers, DNA sequencers, advanced bioreactors, um, advanced metrology equipment. Like we need to make sure that um, we, are, we remain competitive in those parts of the supply chains. So if we think about kind of like, what are the machines that make the machines that make the things, uh, like at the base of the supply chains are some really sophisticated pieces of equipment that are important for the United States to be able to know how to make. Yep, 100%. Um, you know, one, one topic we didn't really touch on uh, super, super cleanly was, was warfare um, and AI. And obviously, given the sort of current situation in, Taiwan, or, uh, in Ukraine, it's, uh, it's highly um, topical and something that I think is um, you know, a lot of what we, we talked about, you know, the U.S. having a consistent tech, technical advantage and the U.S. staying ahead is highly relevant when we think about, you know, the potential warfare implications. Um, you know, in your view, how fundamental of a technology is AI to the future of warfare? Is it something that is, you know, um, uh, going to make a little bit of a difference, going to make a lot of a difference, going to be a stark sort of um, uh, going to be this sort of like stark capability you have or you, you don't? And, and how do you think the United States is, is uh, sort of positioned relative to some of the other great powers? Yeah, I mean, the honest answer is I don't know. I mean, I think um, uh, it's, still, it's still sort of an open question as to like how many kinds kinds of scenarios is, is AI going to enable certain kinds of operations that are you know, impossible without it? There are clearly some. Um, and how many of those show up in the real world is, I, I think, a question that's dependent in part on um, where are the kinds of conflicts that are going to be fought um, in the future. Um, there are certain kinds of scenarios where the application of AI to warfare is likely to asymmetrically disadvantage the United States. Um, because uh, the weapon systems are likely to be very cheap um, and, and easy to deploy at scale. And that's typically not the thing that like the United States excels in compared to other countries, um, that you could, you could imagine a range of scenarios where uh, states that are less wealthy um, and that actually have kind of less uh, access to exquisite technologies emphasize like very large numbers of very cheap drones that are weaponized um, and that they um, they will then kind of have an asymmetric advantage um, through uh, through AI. Um, but I think, you know, the United States advantage in applications of AI is first, we have a lot of data that um, that a lot of other countries don't because we have a lot of like all domain experience um, in uh, in warfare. Um, so there's you know, in principle, sort of more training data uh, for certain kinds of systems. Um, there's also kind of more emphasis that the United States has placed on uh, sort of like all domain awareness and operations and command and control. Um, and then there's, um, there's also, I think, uh, you know, this growing um, interest in figuring out forms of integrated deterrence where you're, you're using um, a variety of different points of leverage um, uh, to uh, to affect sort of an end to a conflict um, or prevent the conflict uh, from happening at all. And I think some of those are likely to involve AI, not just in the military context, but also, um, you know, in the economic context is, um, you know, having um, sort of like more credibility that if, if somebody does something really bad, that we would be able to decouple that country from um, from the financial system uh, that they depend on. Um, and I think some of that is really going to be essential in order to prevent war. Um, as we're seeing in Ukraine, um, like a, a country can do something that is like deeply irrational, um, that, uh, that like doesn't really make sense in terms of its military calculus um, as, as, as Russia did, um, and finding other forms of deterrence um, that can uh, either reduce the likelihood of, of such a conflict starting in the first place or 
reduce the likelihood that it will continue for years is I think really important. And my guess is that AI is gonna be um, essential then to a kind of integrated deterrence strategy. Um, for, for other kinds of applications to, uh, to weapon systems, um, you know, I am really uh, uh, happy that the United States has pledged that it will not incorporate AI and nuclear command and control. Um, and I would love to see pledges from other countries uh, to do that, as I think it's, um, it's pretty destabilizing. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, a fair amount of reporting about the kind of semi-autonomy um, in Russia's nuclear command and control, which is worrisome. I mean, it has all sorts of kind of failure modes that, that seem pretty worrying. Um, and I think it would be uh, a, a point of common interest for the world to try to figure out how to, uh, how to convince countries to not have um, AI uh, embedded within nuclear command and control systems, that there will be a commitment to always having human decision-making um, over nuclear command and control. Um, for, for command and control decisions over um, conventional weapons, I think it's gonna be hard to reach agreement um, about where the, where the bounds are. Um, I, I appreciate the, um, the efforts to like think about what those bounds should be. And I think it's like absolutely a thing that we should continue to study as, as we're studying it at RAND. Um, but it's, it's not clear to me at least where like the natural equilibrium of agreement will be among states, um, some of whom would, um, would, would have uh, advantages militarily and in, um, in introducing more autonomy into their conventional forces, others that would um, like suffer disadvantages um, from doing so. So where that equilibrium ends up being, I'm, I'm not sure of. I think it'll, it'll be really hard to reach. Totally. Well, on that note, uh, on that on that cheery cheery note, um, I uh, I want to thank you so much for for taking the time to, to speak with us today. You know, I I want to thank you for your service in helping to make sure that as a country we make smart policy decisions and we get the right technical and technological insight necessary to make sure that we uh, we make the right decisions. I think that we're going to see the sort of uh, the sort of uh, rewards from your work. Uh, already almost immediately, but over the next many years. And I'm, uh, I think we're very lucky to have you serve in that role. And uh, we're so excited to see what incredible research you do at the RAND Corporation. Well, Alex, if, um, if I can just like uh, brag about you for a bit. I mean, I think one of the really valuable things right now is for technologists to think about how to lend their expertise to, to public policy. And I mean, there are a bunch of different ways of doing that. I mean, you know, there's, um, you can join government, you can join think tanks. Um, I think technologists like often underestimate just how personally rewarding the work can be in helping to, you know, inform policy, educate policymakers, um, you know, contribute to a public mission that can improve um, millions of lives and prevent catastrophes. Um, but I think the kind of example that you set of you know explaining to people like me how a particular technology works and what its implications are, um, being as generous with your time and thoughtfulness as as you've been, and being like really committed to to like technical truth um, on this, um, it's something that I've I've really admired about you and something that that um, that has made me like more feel feel as though. Um, you know, this is this is something that I wish like more technologists would get involved in um, is to to help those of us in policy really understand what's on the horizon and what will it mean for the country. So thanks for everything you're doing. It's a wonderful call to action. There's there's plenty more technologists out there who have, uh, who have incredible insights to lend. So thank you so much, Jason. This has been awesome. Thanks, Alex. Great to see you.